Welcome to our webinar. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. We have an agenda and a um, resource document that we're going to share with you in the chat. You can click on the link for access and give us a few minutes as we start to welcome more attendees in. We get everybody situated and then we will get started. Oh, hey, Coach Howard. I see folks coming from San Jose, Manhattan Beach, Dearborn, Michigan, Pittsburgh, Tacoma, Manitoba. All right, Winnipeg. Look at this. Madison, Wisconsin, Boston, Mass. Wow, Carlsbad, California, LA. Oh, hey, Rebecca. All right, so many different people from different areas. This is amazing. This is going to be a great conversation. Very excited. We're just going to wait a couple minutes, get folks in. Let us know in the chat where you're from. We've got folks from DC, Long Island. Andy from Saki is here, Mexico, all right. Yeah, there's nobody is, <laughs> nobody is able to talk here except for the panelists. So thanks for tuning in. The way that you can interact with folks is in the chat. And if you have a question for one of the panelists, you can put it in the Q&A and our moderator, Erica Ayala, will let us know and she'll get to it when she gets to it. <laughs> All right. Let's give them one more minute, get us all situated and we're gonna get started. <clears throat> Got some really great panelists with us today been waiting for this event. It's going to be really exciting, good conversation, things to think about, action points, all sorts of things that we can take out of this. So let's get started. All right. Well, welcome to the Black Girl Hockey Club Authentic Engagement with a BIPOC community at the youth hockey level brought to you by the Ontario Hockey League's Erie Otters out of Erie, Pennsylvania. What's up, Otter fans? This is a digital event with an agenda and a resource guide available on our website. It was sent to you in an email and it is linked on the online event page over at Eventbrite. Uh, if you want to take a look at that and follow along, or if you want to check it out after the event, it is there for you to enjoy. We are broadcasting on a live stream on YouTube as well. So this will be available after the event. Fingers crossed that we get everything on the tech side right, and you can watch it at your leisure there as well. Now, the Otters organization reached out after the Get Uncomfortable virtual event that we held in October. The entire team and staff examined and signed the Black Girl Hockey Club Get Uncomfortable pledge and committed to hosting this event, 
which is going to be focused on youth hockey, coaching, and the Erie community. Now, the goal of this event is not only to engage BIPOC players and families involved in youth hockey already, but to address what organizations like the Otters and others can do to increase diversity in youth hockey programs while creating a safe and inclusive environment for BIPOC players, families, and fans when they do become involved in hockey. Now, in order to combat the hegemony of the Otters organization, the team has begun to address internal systemic issues, not only by working with Black Girl Hockey Club, but by creating an internal educational program for players, coaches, and staff called Shift Makers. Now, in, on the digital uh, agenda and resource guide, there's a quote from Wes Wolf. He is the assistant coach of the Erie Otters, and it says this, in Erie, we strive to be transformation leaders in the hockey industry. In order to be an active part of the solution, it is important that we take time to recognize and acknowledge any conscious or unconscious biases that exist within hockey and make the necessary shift from being racist or non-racist to anti-racist. Recognizing that hockey can be an insular culture that is based on conformity, our aim is to break down those walls, embrace reform, and engage in change. The Erie Otter's goal is to foster an environment that embraces and celebrates the differences and diversity within our organization and community, and for coaches, parents, and athletes at all levels to do the same within their own organizations. Now, Shift Makers is aimed at addressing the systemic issues that exist in society and in hockey culture. The Otters program has already facilitated two discussions on race and hockey with Trevor Daly, who's a retired NHL player and current hockey operations officer for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Also in attendance, Rico Phillips, who won the Willie O'Ree Community Hero Award in 2019, and he is currently the OHL Director of Cultural Diversity and Inclusion. And of course, Jordan Nolan, who is a National Hockey League player and a First Nations Ambassador. The Otters are currently in the process of setting up a nonprofit extension of the organization under the name Shift Makers, which will be set up to be more involved with the BIPOC community in Erie, including programming, activism, and charitable work. Now, Black Girl Hockey Club really wants to get out to an in-person event with the Otters as soon as we're able to get out on the ice because we believe in the Otters' mission to authentically engage with the local BIPOC community. Now, since we can't meet in person, Black Girl Hockey Club is hosting this free virtual event sponsored and brought to you by the Erie Otters in the hopes of facilitating an honest conversation about race, hockey, and community. Today, I am so excited that we have a collection of amazing panelists and a wonderful moderator to lead out in this discussion. I'm going to introduce you to them now. So let's get all of our panelists. Hi, hello. Can you see our panelists? Hello. All right, this is, this is amazing. I'm so excited that you guys are here. So let me just remind the group that the chat function is open. I see everyone talking to one another. Uh, you, it's available to webinar attendees who are watching on Zoom. So if you clicked, clicked the uh, Eventbrite link, you should be able to have access to the chat as well as the Q&A function. We will be addressing questions in the Q&A. So if you have anything you would like to ask an individual panelist, this is how you do it. You go to the Q&A, not the chat, because that's going a mile a minute and we aren't gonna be able to catch all those questions. If you have an individual question, you have to put it in the Q&A so that we can pull it out, address it with the larger panel. Um, if you're watching on the YouTube live stream, you'll not be able to engage with the panelists, but you can have your own little YouTube chat over there. Uh, so again, check out the email sent to you as your registration confirmation and look for that link in order to have access to the panelists and to ask those burning questions. This event is also accessible and will be captioned through a company called Space. 
If you're interested in using this service for your own digital events, their information is on our digital handout and that's also available on our website. So before I introduce our panelists and moderators, I want to say thank you to the Black Girl Hockey Club volunteers who helped make this happen. Yes, we're giving a silent clap to you. We have folks working in tech, creating handouts, curating questions and discussion topics, and making sure that this is an enjoyable and seamless experience for you, the viewer. Most of our volunteers are Black women and allies from the hockey community who are passionate about equity and inclusion. If you would like to support Black Girl Hockey Club and our anti-racism work, you can donate at blackgirlhockeyclub.org. You can follow us on Twitter or on Instagram. You can join our private Facebook group. You can find all of this and more important information linked in our social media bios. All right, so let's see here. How, how, first of all, let me just ask the group, how are those captions working out? Did we get the captions going yet? Let's see here. We do have a question in queue. That. Yeah, we have a question in queue about that, Renee. All right, the moderator. Okay. All right, so to our, hold on a second to our dear attendees. Uh, just we're, to we're, our Black Girl Hockey Club tech person, you've got to turn on captioning and assign Lisa Tron, Troncoso to um, the caption job. There we go. Perfect. Thank you everyone for being patient with us. We just wanna make sure that this event is accessible and that everyone who wants to participate can participate. All right. Okay, so the first person I wanna introduce you to is Mike Watson. You might remember Mike from our October Get Uncomfortable virtual event and his rousing breakout room, which focused on coaching youth hockey. Uh, Mike is current president of the Columbus Ice Hockey Club, which is a Hockey is for Everyone program that allows youth from diverse communities in central Ohio the opportunity to develop core values through hockey. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the last Black Girl Hockey Club meetup, which was held March 1st, was actually in conjunction with the Columbus Ice Hockey Club and the Columbus Blue Jackets. It's good to see you, Mike. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Can't wait uh, for the season to start and fans to be allowed in so we can do another meetup, make it bigger and better than ever. Yes, I love that. Now, I, one thing I wanna ask you for tonight, um, what are your goals for this event? What are you hoping to, to come out of this? My goal for this event tonight is to just present some ideas, provoke some thought, um, and really help people uh, begin to elevate their thinking and understanding that anything is possible. You know, the time is now. You have a lot of people out there who want to help with this much needed conversation that needs to happen. Um, there's a lot of experience out there to tap into. And just having a forum like this brings everybody together who's trying to solve a problem. I think he was saying, you know, we're expecting north of 200 people on this call. That's 200 people that are committed to doing something. And you know what? We're going to be able to do it because we're going to work together. So for me, that's what I'm looking for, making those connections tonight uh, with people, getting ideas out there, different ways, you know, different times call for different ways of thinking. And I think we're here and from a hockey perspective too as well. Yes, I agree. This is going to be the goal of all of us, I think, tonight to facilitate these conversations and to, to keep it going, to keep it moving, okay. right? Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate you. No all problem. Right. I appreciate you too. So next we have Soroya Tinker. Hi, Soroya. Your name. Thanks for having me. Soroya is an amazing Black Girl Hockey Club activist. She is a professional ice hockey player for the Metropolitan Riveters of the National Women's Hockey League. And she recently obtained a double bachelor's degree. Didn't know it was double, 
Soroya in a, a history of science, medicine, and public health and sociology from Yale University. Congratulations. Uh, Soroya has joined Black Girl Hockey Club for a number of virtual events uh, in the past nine months and recently took a position on the board of directors of the Columbus Ice Hockey Club. Congratulations, Soroya, on all your recent success and welcome. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the congrats. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I always love doing my events with Black Girl Hockey Club, something that comes first in my head. Um, it's definitely a space that I enjoy being in and one of the most comfortable I've been in in terms of the hockey community. So I really appreciate your space. That's what it's all about. That's what, that's what we're here for. So I want to know what has made you become so active in anti-racism work in hockey in the last year? Yeah, um, I'll be honest, I, I really thought my career was coming to an end and didn't think the game had a lot to give back to me. And I didn't really think that I had a lot to give back to it just because of the racial charge situations that I have had. Um, so with that, I, I have a 10 year old brother and, and my parents really wanted me to continue playing and, and really wanted me to be in the hockey world still. Um, so I, I realized that maybe I needed to take a different look on it and, and realize that I'm doing it for the, the girls that are coming behind me um, and helping create that path for them. So um, I think for me, it's really about the, the girls behind me and, and nothing to do with myself because I, I, I realize my career is coming to an end, but also realizing that I can reach out and help a lot of other uh, black queens out there. So that's right. that's right. You know, and it is all about the ones that come after. I just got to let you know that in the chat, uh, Meredith admits to having a sticker of you on her water bottles. So <laughs> I love that's it. pretty cool that you are a water bottle sticker. I love that. Thank you so much, Soroya. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. All right, so next, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Tunisia Singleton, Black Girl Hockey Club board member and new media professional. Now, Dr. Singleton is committed to making sports equally meaningful, inclusive, and fun for everyone. Tanisha's work focuses on using innovation and consumer insight to inform the design of content marketing and community involvement in sports and beyond. Tanisha is a sports fan, a fan of Black women, and hosts the I Have Questions podcast, of which I was the first ever guest. So thank you so much for being here with us today, doctor. Oh, I thank you. And thank you for being the first guest on my, my podcast. And yeah, I want to start making some stickers so I could be on some. I of know, right? We all need to be water bottle stickers. I'm saying. Absolutely. That's why I'm here to be a sticker. <laughs> So Dr. Singleton, please, can you give us a little bit of insight on how new media and content marketing intersect with these concepts of diversity and inclusion that we're talking about tonight? Sure. Um, you know, I thought my career at first was going to be, you know, all about taking over Hollywood and being a, you know, producer, director, screenwriter, all these things when you're a doe-eyed 20 year old, you know, and going into college and doing all this film stuff. But then I, you know, I moved to LA. I did that for like 12 years and realized it was kind of gross. <laughs> it was very toxic and I didn't like it after all. And so I sought out something that would reignite my motivation and would really start to make a difference where it counts. And so I got my PhD in psychology with an emphasis in media. And I like to describe my career as kind of like that one-two punch of art and science, that being like innovation and psychology so that I could turn my attention on working more with brands and nonprofit organizations like Black Girl Hockey Club on projects that you know are surround mental health and promoting black voices and LGBTQ empowerment. So really I think with my background and working as an advisor and consultant in all of these different spaces of technology and consumer brands, esports, and, and digital media, I think it's all about that intersection of sports, story, and society. And so when you focus on those pillars, you, I'm finding new ways where we can radically reinvent new forms of education and storytelling and, and doing that through conscious content development. And so I'm really grateful and excited um, that you invited me here to this space to offer some strategies about growth in the hockey culture specifically to make sure that it's more inclusive and really welcoming for everyone. 
Yes, and Tanisha, you know that you and I could talk about fandom for hours on end. And if you want to hear us talk about fandom for at least what, like an hour and a half, an hour, yeah, check out her podcast, and you will hear us. Thank you so much, uh, Tanisha. Thank Looking you. forward to this conversation. Last but not least, we have Miss Erica Ayala. Please say hello to her. She is a longtime friend of Black Girl Hockey Club and a professional sports journalist. Hello, Erica. Hola, mi gente. Hey, so excited to have you here, fam. Now, if you don't know Erica, Erica has bylines in the New York Times, in the Washington Post. She writes regularly for The Nine, which is a curated guide to women's sports. She hosts Sports Talk on her YouTube page and the Founding Four podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts amazing she is on the cutting edge of women's sports she's moderated a number of discussions for black girl hockey club including our 2020 juneteenth discussion welcome erica thank you so much for moderating for us today of course it's always uh, glad to be with my people kind of like what soroya was talking about this has always been an inclusive space um i see some friends uh in the chat so thank you all for continuing I giving support. you shout outs i i'm i'm feeling the love it's it's because we've all you know been able to experience time together at hockey games now virtually and and so i'm just glad to be here oh man we're glad to have you and like you said you have been with black girl hockey club since day one can you tell us a bit about how the you have seen the culture shift in the hockey community in the past couple of years I think it's more of just like, hey, we in here, you know, like uh, being able to recognize different faces and names. A lot of times as a Black Latina in any profession, uh, you wonder if you're getting passed by for opportunities or not even aware of opportunities just because you don't find your, your way in, in any particular network. But Black Girl Hockey Club, I think, has been one of the amazing networks that has definitely grown over time and with Get Uncomfortable and a lot of other things hap that have happened in 2020, um, I think that we now, with that exposure of people like Soroya, of uh, I see Mr. Smith in the chat, of course, uh, you know, Mr. Watson is here with us. I think that we are starting to really connect the dots and be a bigger, better, stronger community. And so I think that will yield really good results when it comes to hockey culture and permeate elsewhere, hopefully. That's what it's all about, building community, being there for one another, and using education as a tool to make something that we all love better. So Erica, I'm going to hand it over to you. I will be uh, on silent mode monitoring the Q&A, and I'll see you all on the other side. Thank you so much, Renee. Let's give it up in the chat for Renee Hess, founder of Black Girl Hockey Club. Um, and y'all forgive me, I gotta adjust my headphones here so I get the curls to a place where I like them. So while I'm doing that, <laughs> I'm gonna let you know how it's gonna go. We have our panelists that Renee introduced us all to, and then I am going to facilitate a conversation. We're gonna start with Mike Watson. This is the time that if you wanna move any questions that you have over for an individual panelists, you're gonna wanna move that over to the question and answer box, the little tabby tab at the bottom. That's where you're gonna to wanna to post your questions. And so first up is Mike Watson and welcome again, sir. Good to have you. How you feeling tonight? Good to be here. I'm feeling great. You know, I am excited, you know, as an ally of Black Girl Hockey Club, I always get energized and amazed, you know, when, when the organization reaches out um, and asks me to participate because, you know, I am a firm believer in allyship, you know, supporting the organization, making sure that Black women can lead in this, in, in this important conversation too as well. So just thank you for having me. Glad to connect with you once again. And you're no stranger to Black Girl Hockey Club here, but uh, we want to engage the folks that are listening on and watching on in a conversation about youth hockey. And so yeah. you are going to be our expert on, on youth hockey here. Um, so why don't you tell us first a little bit about the Columbus Ice Hockey Program and how that relates to USA Hockey and the Hockey is for Everyone program. Yeah, so Columbus Ice Hockey Club, we're based out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, we probably 
teach, you know, in any given year, you know, three to 4,000 kids how to skate, then we transition them into a learn to play hockey program, you know, with the goal eventually of putting them into our own house program that we have to as well, you know, that in the house program, you know, we probably have total about 300 skaters. Um, we are recognized by USA Hockey. So, you know, we are an organization, you know, we do field teams, we do fill out rosters. Um, and, you know, we've been part of the NHL's Hockey is for Everyone initiative, you know, since its inception. You know, we've been around since 1997. So, you know, we're going on almost, you know, 23 years of being at it. I've been president for about 14, uh, 15 years. And just to see um, how hockey continues to evolve in a city like Columbus, you know, we got one of the expansion franchises many years ago. You know, we're not an original kind of six type city, but, you know, just, just to see the growth and how that has happened and the types of people that need to be involved in the growth. And that's why I kind of get excited for this conversation because the models of how to be inclusive and how to expand the pipeline of diversity and inclusivity um, in your hockey programs, that model's already out there, right? This isn't something new that you have to go and research. You know, many of us, you know, we volunteer in hockey, but we have day jobs in our day jobs we solve this issue, right? So it's not, it's not like we're asking somebody to do something new, something incredible. We're asking you to do what you do on a daily basis anyway, right? Just think outside the box. You know, me and Renee talk about this all the time. Tanisha talk about this all the time. You know, Black Girl Hockey Club is doing something great, but guess what? There are other organizations that are putting Black women at the forefront too as well. And they've got some fantastic ideas. So I say to anybody who's thinking about inclusivity, diverse, you know, diversity, the, the roadmaps are out there. The information is out there. The people who can help you are out there. The experts are out there. You just have to think outside the box and go and ask for help. And I always tell people, when's the last time you asked someone for help? And they said no. I love that. I love that. There's so much that you gave us. And there's a quote actually I have right here. Argue for your limitations and they are surely yours, Richard Bach. So just like you said, if there's if there's a challenge, go find someone that can help you solve it. And that is what this community, of course, is here for. But you hit on a few things, maybe not uh, Columbus not being an original six market. You also talked about some of the learn to skate programs that are a part of the, the Columbus ice hockey program. So we'll start there because we want to speak to maybe parents and families that are listening in uh, that maybe have a child that, that is a hockey loving child. And so if, if you have uh, families that didn't grow up around the hockey community, what would you suggest um, that they engage in when it comes to learning the game for the sake of their, their children? You know, I'm a big proponent of this because I was that person. I, I knew nothing of hockey. And I always tell the story um, to people when my son first started skating, like his first actual hockey where he put on the equipment, had the, had the shin guards, had the elbow pads, had the shoulder pads. And you know what? I sent him out there with a football jersey on. I knew nothing, right? I knew nothing about the game, right? But then I got, I was just fascinated because when you see the smiles, when kids connect with the activity, you know, I felt as a parent, my responsibility was to educate myself. But let's now fast forward. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to expect parents to do that. So if we want to continue to diversify the game, why not have the information readily available at the point of contact when we first come in contact with these kids, right? Mm -hmm. How do we continue to educate along the way? There are so many levels to hockey, but having that knowledge is what unlocks, you know, a kid that's a dreamer, right? And I always tell people, you know, most kids, when they start playing hockey, they're kids with dreams, right? And I see us as the dream makers, right? So who are we to say, no, you can't do this. This is not possible. It's our job to make anything possible. And anything possible could be all the way to an NHL pro, or it could be carving out other ways you can contribute to this game too as well. So for me, I'm like, let's start that education process early. Right. So people can see that there are many ways they can stay involved in this game, you know, besides as they continue to learn how to play and excel and hopefully move on to different stages of the game. But guess what? There are just so many things that they can do and so many things that this game teaches to kids that can, you can apply to other aspects of their life. 
Absolutely. It starts with a learn to play, a learn to skate, you know, and then you, and then you just continue to progress from there. Absolutely. And already I see in our Q&A box, a lot of what you're saying is resonating with people, whether they want to engage directly in the hockey uh, aspect of your organization, or just, as you said, the education, the learning, yeah. the engagement. So I see a question. That's what, here. I, that's what I find, right? Hockey's issue is for so long, you know, access to the elitist of levels mm. was very secretive. Not every, It's almost like you felt you had to have the secret code which really was unlocked by this elite level talent of a kid. It shouldn't be that way, right? Hockey is for everyone, right? And, and when kids are young, you know, they need to learn that. They need to, we need to nurture that in them, right? Not try and make it as exclusive as possible. And I, and I can tell you right now, there are people working. There's probably 250 people on this call that are working to open up access to this game, right? Because when you open up access to this game, what it really opens up is opportunity. And what's opportunity? Opportunity is the American dream, right? And we need to make sure that everybody has equal access to grab that opportunity if they want it. I love it. And so I'm just going to get to a few questions here for you, Mr. Watson. Uh, Lisa Laskin asking just uh, quickly, you know, that the, the Learn to Skate program, she says, is amazing. But is this the main Learn to Skate program in Columbus? Well, Columbus has a variety of organizations. We're just one of, I would say, probably seven, eight hockey organizations. But that's why I said Columbus is a great model because, you know, all of our organizations, we work together, right? We work together to make sure that kids, because some of the organizations are, are very much tied to the location of where kids live, right? And then we have, we have other organizations that deal with kind of the elite players of the world, the AAA Blue Jacket organization, right? And, but what happens is, you know, and then we have the ranks, sorry. So then we have the ranks who do their own learn to skate programs too as well. So at any one time as a collective um, Central Ohio uh, marketplace, we could probably have anywhere from five to 600 kids learning to play hockey at once. Mm, wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. And you know, the importance of a Columbus ice hockey club is providing that opportunity for, for those individuals who might not have the wherewithal to go and sign up for a, for a learn escape program at the local rink. Right. So, you know, we, we give out a tremendous amount of scholarship dollars, you know, and we provide, you know, equipment assistance, you name it, in order to make sure that these kids can learn to play hockey. There's 28 rec centers in Columbus, Ohio. And so we facilitate the Learn to Skate program for all 28 rec centers. Wow. So, I mean, just hearing you go through that, it just sounds like there's really wraparound and there's a lot of involvement um, and collaboration that happens in community. So Pete has a question here for you. Uh, it's coming from... Uh, Tacoma, Washington, uh, patching yeah. in today from Tacoma, you know, what advice would you give to a small and new market expecting a large influx of hockey interest, perhaps maybe because of that new Seattle team that's coming? Prepare, 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 set realistic goals, right? Ex you've got that base that's excited. Don't be afraid to ask for help, right? Mm -hmm. Invest in planning, you know, most of the times when, when I see organizations that fail, they don't really invest in a good plan, right? So anticipate the crush. What's the plan? How are we, how are we thinking we're going to build this? Because the demand is going to be there. But be, be realistic about the plan. You know, it's, it's funny. Columbus Ice Hockey Club and even some of the house programs, the AAA program talks about all the time, we were not built overnight. So when I say set realistic goals, it's exactly that. You know, what do we expect to accomplish in the first year, the second year, the third year? Because when you do that, then it's easy to go out and get the help of the people to rally around your goals. And that's where Columbus Ice Hockey Club, we really took off as an organization. We set off a strategic plan of the things that we wanted to achieve. And then we went and found the subject matter expertise to help us achieve those goals. And we got a board and we had, we had volunteers and everybody rallying around those goals. So from a Learn Escape program, you say, hey, we want to impact 200 lives this year. Rally people around that goal. How are we going to get these kids? How are we going to get the funding? Because when you have clear goals, it's easy to line up all your allies after that. 
That's such good advice. I believe it was Benjamin Franklin that told us if you fail, if you uh, fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So excellent advice there, no, no matter how small the market, but especially for someone Correct. who might be neighboring a, a certain Seattle Kraken market, ride the wave is what I hear you saying. Exactly. Ride the wave, take the help, understand what your needs are. And you know what? I'm going to tell you this, right? So Roy is a great example of this. If you have the talent, it doesn't matter the age. You know, I've interacted with Soroya at the board level, Columbus Ice Hockey Club. We've interacted with Soroya. And we were like, you know what? Soroya's a superstar. We got to get her on board because we're trying to build out our girls hockey program right now. Who better than somebody who just came out of the system? Soroya, what worked for you? What didn't work for you, right? So you have to be willing to listen also to the, to the people that kind of come to you and, and volunteer their hands, right? Be, and they might be somebody that you would never expect or would never be passionate, right? But the point is, you know, they have a point of view and they're gonna help, right? And so you wanna make yourself available. I love that. Um, I see we have a question here uh, from one Andre Coleman. If that is who I think it is. Hey, Theo, how you doing? <laughs> but uh, how do we, in these times of lockdown and virtual schooling, keep children engaged? You know, if, if and he's asking if you have any help on how you as an, as an ice hockey program, it's a, yeah. you know, a pretty physical, you know, program that I would imagine has to rearrange things with social distancing. How are you doing that? You know, a, a couple of things, you know, we're, you know, I will say we're still impacted by the pandemic. Our rank where we host the majority of our program out of is still closed down, right? So we've had to touch our kids via Zoom, you know, so you do Zoom training. Um, you know, Soroya has been, you know, very gracious. You know, she talked to the girls that were in our program, right? So we had a wonderful hour and a half conversation about, you know, what it's like to be a female playing hockey, you know, and then a diverse female at that. You know, the majority of the young ladies that were on the call, they were all playing on boys teams, right? And so it was amazing to see some of the questions that they were asking from, from their experiences. Uh, and then what we've had to do is we've had, like I tell people, you know, we've had to kind of evolve ourselves in this pandemic type atmosphere. So for the couple of teams we still have playing, our JV team and our girls team, we practice social distancing guidelines. You know, we follow the guidelines that are that are really put out by the state. So, you know, right now we've kind of been shut down a little bit till December 18th, but, you know, we anticipate getting getting started back up. But, you know, there are ways to kind of stay in contact with your kids. And, and this is another thing that burns me up, right? It burns me up because I think we also have an opportunity to, to instruct these kids on ways that they can continue to progress their hockey skills without having to be on ice, right? So let me give you a perfect example. You know, when a kid is growing up, you know, they can put on rollerblades or roller hockey skates and go out in the street and stick handle. They can stick handle in their garage, right? Particularly when they're smaller, they don't need a lot of space in order to, to progress in this game, right? So it's continuing to think outside of the box. What are some of the activities that kids can do? And you can do some research on, online. Like for example, stick handling. I saw there's a little worksheet and you do like 30 different stick handling things for five minutes a day. And if you think about it, right, if you do 30 of those things, five minutes, you spend 150 minutes. But if you times that over three times a week, just think you're naturally going to get better as you engage in this game. So I think the challenge that I would say to the coaches that are on the call is what are the things that you teach on ice that you can translate to off ice for these kids too as well to continue to progress their skills while they're waiting, you know, for the pandemic to pass, you know, the vaccines to get out there and things like that. All right. I love that. And shout out. I see we have someone uh, giving some propos to the LA Kings. Uh, they have developed a program and I know someone who works with that organization. Of course, Blake Bolden is another person yeah. you've seen get creative with some of uh, the online tutorials and shout out to Blake, of course, huge friend of Black Girl Hockey Club. Uh, and I, I always tell people, try it, try it. If it doesn't work, then try something else. Right. But, you know, the worst thing we can do right now is not try. 
Yes, absolutely. And so we are coming close to time here. So we're going to wrap up with a few more questions. If you have one last burning question, now's the time to get that in for Mike Watson. But uh, we have a question here. How realistic is it to get a BIPOC child to a pro level from a non-traditional market? Um, you know what? I will I will say because we have one at Columbus Ice Hockey Club. He's been on a panel, Iodelia Denier, right? I this is a part of hockey that people have to understand. You have to be realistic. And what I mean by that is if you look at the odds of of getting to the pro level in general, I think it's like 0.0008% of total people who play hockey. But I'm telling you, when I look at kids like Io. Uh, this summer, there's a program called Next Gen AAA. They took an all minority team up to the Boston Beantown Cup. And, you know, they went and won the tournament. It was all BIPOC kids. And guess what? Some of those kids have already been drafted. So can it happen? Absolutely. But I think what we have to be realistic about is, you know, as you continue to progress in the game, it's like this triangle that gets to the tip, right? And I tell people, if you work hard, if you're committed, you know, then, then you can have success in this game. And one of the things that we're even looking at from a Columbus Ice Hockey Club perspective is we've developed kind of like the step ladder of how you get there, but it's also allowing these kids to talk with people that have made it, right? So, because I bet you, if you talk to Soroya about what her schedule looked like and what she does on a daily basis, you would find that behind that success is a ton of hard work. There's no like, hey, I just spent an hour a day on ice and I miraculously got to where I'm at. No, she's worked hard. She's put in the time, you know, and I, and I, and so the way I like to answer the question is it absolutely is possible from a non-traditional market. Columbus, Ohio is a non-traditional market. And I can tell you here, they've already produced like five or six pros, right? And then we've got kids that are now playing at the prep school level, junior level. So it's about getting that flywheel going, right? And it all starts with an investment and learn to skate right? Mm -hmm. And then you just grow the program from there. And you got to make sure everyone has access to the same opportunities. Because when they have access to the same opportunities, then amazing things happen in these non-traditional markets. I love that. And I think that will lead us to the last few questions that we have here as far as opportunity. We yep. see one question here, and I would love also maybe for Renee at one point to weigh in here, but you know, uh, Dr. Mark Hogue would love your thoughts on um, scholarship opportunities and, and programs perhaps that the Columbus Ice Hockey Program knows of. And of course, again, would love Renee Hess to, to weigh in there. But then also thinking of maybe adult learn to skate. I see that Jeff is asking maybe is there a connection in building you know, yep. uh, a community of hockey loving people, even in a non-traditional market, if those opportunities are available as well? Absolutely. This is what I love, thinking outside the box. So from a Columbus Ice Hockey Club perspective, we have a scholarship program. It's mainly for our kids here um, in Central Ohio. So we have partners, the Columbus Blue Jackets, the NHL, you know, some private donors in the community, City of Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, you know, to make sure that any kid who wants to skate has that ability to skate, right? So we beat the kids where they are. We have an equipment bank that we have. I mean, probably over, you know, $300,000 worth of equipment that sits down there. We've got like a good trade-in program where, you know, as a kid outgrows, they can bring the stuff back and they can trade it out and they can go into the equipment that, that fits them. But, you know, I think from a scholarship perspective, um, I will tell you, this is something, particularly the hockey community, is very passionate about is teaching kids how to skate, helping them, helping them progress in the game of hockey, right? And so I think it's finding those people that are passionate and Renee can attest to that, right? With her scholarship program, seeing it explode, right? Because now's the time, like people understand this inclusivity and diversity is here to stay in all corners of our society, right? So people wanna make sure that it's happening. What can I do, right? And then, and then I also love the notion because a lot of people, you know, we, we tend to focus just on the kids, right? But this game is so much more expansive than just the kids. If you yes, want yes. to build a rabid fan base, you have to make sure everyone feels included. 
That is includes the adults who want who want to learn to play hockey. That includes the special needs. That includes you, you see what I'm saying. We want to make it as inclusive as possible. So at Ice Hockey Club, not only do we have kind of a house hockey program, we have a blind hockey program, we have a sled hockey program, we have a special needs hockey program. We're touching all facets of of the hockey community of people who want to learn to play. And that's why I tell people, think about it from that way, that angle too as well. But I love that idea of the adult learn to skate. You know, they do that here in Columbus. And then guess what happens? Those adults who love the game, they start to teach the game, right? And that's what you want. And I always tell people, you know, if we want to increase uh, diversity, inclusivity, you know, black and brown people in the game, we have to make sure that they're represented in all facets of this game not just the on ice product. Well, Mike Watson, thank you so much for that rundown. It, seeing all of the questions, you obviously were resonating, particularly with the adults and, and, and families, the adults in families here that are hockey loving people themselves or have hockey loving children that they're, they're raising. So thank you so much for that. We're gonna hang on to some of these questions. We're gonna keep you around and see if we can circle back to some other things. But a, another question that I see in here a lot is, is how to get that hook. And Mr. Watson, you mentioned actually bringing in Soroya Tinker to talk about the youth program. And so I'm going to use that as a transition. We're going to slide to the left and we're going to bring in a we're going to bring in Soroya Tinker here to maybe talk a little bit about that. So Soroya, I would love to start off with perhaps how you got involved with the Columbus ice hockey program um, and and why you see that perhaps as, as a fruitful way to grow the game. Yeah, for sure. Um, it all started uh, when when Mike reached out to me and just asked me if I had any plans or any visions for what I would want to implement into a women's ice hockey program. Um, and with that, he, he knows that I have that level of expertise and was willing to to give me the floor and um, and talk to his his players. So uh, with that, I was able to have a little panel with them uh, where they were able to ask me questions. And I think for me, uh, a lot of this revolves around representation. So um, with them being able to see me as a, as a black woman in their shoes, um, as an older individual, making it my way through the game, uh, I definitely think it's helpful just because we don't see that all the time. Um, so in, in terms of representation, they, they need to see people who look like them and, and know that they can do it. And so I wanted to get to some of those questions that we had from the last panel, but I want to remind everyone who is listening in, we are now talking to Soroya Tinker, who played at Yale University and will be playing in the upcoming, I think I'm going with N double. I don't know if that's official. That might just be the hashtag I want to see, but there will be a single site NWHL season in Lake Placid, and you will be representing the Metropolitan Riveters of the National Women's Hockey League. So this is the moment. If you have questions for Soroya Tinker, put those over in the chat box. But I want to, Soroya, talk a little bit about your experience. You've, you've alluded to it a little bit, and just that, quite honestly, you, you were maybe ready to, to part ways with hockey because of the lack of diversity that you saw coming up. So maybe if you could describe you know, what kept you going, uh, even though you were one of the, the only, if, if not the only, uh, you know, BIPOC player on the ice. Yeah, for sure. I think um, I've told my, my story many times, but uh, for those who don't know, I grew up just outside of Toronto in Oshawa, Ontario, um, where my dad got me into hockey. Uh, so growing up, my dad is black, my mom's white, um, and my dad grew up in Scarborough, Ontario. So um, playing in Scarborough, he experienced a lot of racism playing. Uh, my dad never played at a super high level or anything, but he wanted to put his kids in the game so that we could experience the love for it that he has. Um, I would say I would say growing up, it was pretty difficult. I didn't have anybody on my team that I truly connected with. And for me, I've never been a person who's ever had trouble making friends really or, or connecting or conversating with others. So uh, I, I think for me, that was kind of weird to see and I wasn't able to fully um, be a part of my team, which I think is upsetting in those sense because 
we often look to our teammates to be another family for us. And I didn't quite have that. So growing up, I experienced a lot of uh, microaggressions where my dad would always just say, let it go in one ear and out the other. Um, and the type of person I am, I, I kind of just put my head down and do what I have to do and, and put in the work. So for me, I was okay being alone on my team and okay putting in the work by myself and knowing that I was trying to make it to a certain level. Um, but at the same time, I didn't, I knew that I didn't have that same level of support as many of my other teammates did. Um, so all the way up through, I, I would say the first time I was ever blatantly called the N-word in my dressing room, I was around 13 um, with the team I was playing for. And, and at that point in time, there were no consequences. And for me, I was told to uh, not let it affect how I play. So uh, for me, this was obviously incredibly frustrating. And I think that through Yale, I let the frustration follow me. Uh, which led to a hatred for the game, um, which again, anybody who, who, who knows me on a deeper level knows that I, I did not love the game my senior, my senior year and, and throughout my Yale career. So as difficult as it was to hate hockey, but also love being on the ice, um, it just led for a, a weird interaction. Um, and, and with that, I, I didn't know where I stood after my career. So Having graduated in May, I didn't think I wanted to still play, but uh, I entered the draft and, and was drafted pretty high by the Metropolitan Riveters. So I decided to continue playing, but I also realized that I needed to, ch to change my mindset um, and that it wasn't about me anymore. It was about the girls that follow. Um, so I knew, I knew that I had trouble making friends and finding that comfortable space when I played. So I am now making an effort to make sure that the girls behind me are able to have that person and able to have somebody to look up to. I love it. Fourth overall. That was what I was doing in case <laughs> that was unclear. Um, I love all of that. And I have been blessed to hear your story a few times, but there's always this one thing that stands out to me and I'm going to give everyone another quote. Cause I love quotes. Who doesn't love quotes? And um, you know, we have uh, not everything that is faced can be changed but uh, nothing can be changed until it is faced. And so Soroya, I want to ask you, and I also see we have a question here about, you know, things that maybe coaches or a coach did to make you feel differently. There had to be a turning point, obviously, not only for you to continue your own personal career, but for you to take the time that you uh, are giving back, doing your own mentorship, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So what was that turning point? What was that moment when you're like, you know what, I can make a choice. Uh, to make this better? Yeah, I, I think um, throughout my Yale career, I was always very frustrated, as I said before, and I didn't know what the right steps were to take because me being outspoken and, and blunt and honest with my teammates led me to me being a bully, I guess, or so people saw, um, or I was saying the wrong thing, whereas they're not understanding because they're not in my shoes as to why I felt excluded. Um, but I would say it wasn't until my senior year where I had a coach, Mark Golding, uh, he's the current Yale women's ice hockey coach right now. Um, he came in and was hired and, and right off the bat, he made an effort to get to know me. Um, he made an effort to call me into his office and just talk about was whatever was going on that day, um, ask about my family and ask about the things that I valued. And with that, I felt like I was able to create that connection with my coach, which I think is super important because I think getting to know your, your players is one of the biggest things coaches can do in terms of helping their players improve. Um, so for me, I definitely don't think I had the best senior season, but I definitely enjoyed being on the ice a lot more just because I knew that I had a coach that supported me and was willing to be an ally and speak up for me when I needed uh, to be spoken up for. And, and that happened a few times last year for sure. Uh, where he was able to to call them into his office and explain to them why it made me uncomfortable. And I think that a lot of players on my team were able to to see um, their their actions and see how it affected me um, and not only affected me last year, but throughout my my whole four years. So I think a lot of people had realizations. And I, I definitely think that um, having a good coach is a huge part of any program. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a BIPOC coach, but it has to be an ally and somebody who's willing to listen and, and learn from their players. Because I think us players 
obviously learn a lot from our coaches, but our coaches can learn a lot from us in terms of the way they coach and in the terms of the, in, in the ways that they, they handle situations. So uh, that was definitely huge. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And, and from what I gather from your story, it's not necessarily that your coach was like, well, Hey, tell me, tell me about racism. You know, uh, it was more just the coach, as you said, getting to know you getting to know Soroya and by learning more about his players able to differentiate when maybe there was something that was not sitting well with you. Um, and, you know, you talked about coaches and obviously we're, we're talking about youth hockey, but I think, again, thinking about a wraparound, thinking about a, a community aspect to inclusivity, there are things that, that we can do as adults or just peer to peer even. And so I'd like to use this time now to talk a little bit about your mentorship program and the approach that you're taking and, and how you think that that fits into creating spaces where we're really celebrating uh, who people are and encouraging them and empowering them to be successful. For sure. I, I again, I think that um, at the end of my career, I kind of had to have a shift and see where um, I wanted to give back to hockey and see how hockey could give back to me. And with that, I find that I, I love inspiring young women and, and obviously being a role model. Uh, I mentioned my younger brother before. I know I'm a big role model for him in terms of hockey. So um, in that sense, I really thought that it would be important for me to be that person, be that go-to friend, um, be that go-to mentor for these young women. Uh, so that's why I decided to start my mentorship program, um, which I offer completely free. Um, and I just think that that's, that's the best way to go about it right now, just because I know that young black women need friends and they, they need that support um, with people who look like them and have that same, same mindset. And I know that they wanna get to the same level that, that I've been at. So uh, if whatever I can do to help them, uh, I'm going to do. Um, so my mentorship program, uh, I talk to a lot of the girls on, on Zoom, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they're also free to text me whenever. Um, and, and, and it's really just a, a circle where we can develop our mental health and, and uh, be well together, um, just because I did not have that. And I realized that in, if I'm going to still be involved in hockey, that it's my job to make sure that they feel secure in themselves and that they know that they can do it as well. That's fantastic. And so Soroya, we will make sure to uh, let people know where they can follow you, but why don't you, while we have you still, just go ahead and plug where people can sign up for your mentoring program. Yeah, for sure. I, I believe it's on the pamphlet that's been ha handed out um, through this panelist. Um, and then also it's on my link tree on all, all my social media. All my social, social media is Soroya Tinker 71 um, so uh, that's Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, everything. So uh, my DMs and my email, my, I think my phone number's on there. Everything's open. Um, I will reply as busy as I am. Um, I love to get those messages. So I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we see that it's been popped there in the chat and again uh, is on the flyer. But Soroya, while we have you, we know that there are some hockey players. There are some folks that are looking to do some off ice training for hockey players. So uh, for the next few minutes, let's talk about what your process is looking like. I mentioned that there will be a single site season that you're preparing for. Of course, coronavirus has impacted uh, what, what all seasons will look like. So you won't start up until next month. But how are you preparing? for the Lake Placid bubble? Yeah, so currently um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the majority of my team is in New Jersey actually right now, but um, I had a research position that I needed to finish out here in Calgary, Alberta. Um, so I'm currently training um, nonstop. Uh, <laughs> right now I currently box Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, then I, I lift um, with my lifting partner, my boyfriend. Uh, so I'm just going hard in the gym and preparing, um, hitting the ODRs out here for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but other than that, just uh, mentally preparing really just to um, enter the bubble and, and do what I have to do in terms of the, the social justice initiatives that I want to have with my team. And, and I look forward to implementing in the bubble and um, hopefully having my teammates stand with me. Um, I'm going now back to the the Q&A here, uh, our little Q&A bubble. We're going to go to Wes. So you and I have talked about microaggressions before, and it's been alluded to even in our conversation right now. So beyond education, 
what are some things, Soroya, that you would like to see um, coaches and even players that are witnessing these things happen in real time be able to do? What would you equip them with? Yeah, I, I think be, I always say it, um, I'm always unapologetically me, but I also think that they need to be unapologetically them. Um, and if that means standing up and, and speaking up for, for what you believe in and, and telling people that you didn't find something uh, to be right or you weren't comfortable with something. So I would encourage people to be comfortable calling people out, uh, be comfortable um, reflecting on your own experiences and, and learning or unlearning your own uh, racist practices um, and also giving that information to your teammates. Um, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be an attack if you're calling somebody out, but um, again, educating them. So I think that there's many ways to educate people. Um, and if they're willing to listen, then, then we have to do that and have to find our allies for sure. And uh, I'll get you out of here on this one. We have another question here from Bonnie. Just, you know, you've created a mentorship program. You're a part of now Black Girl Hockey Club, Columbus Ice Hockey Club. What advice or suggestions do you have for, for people who want to create groups so that others aren't losing that passion and that love for hockey because of unfortunately microaggressions or overt covert racism that they experience? Yeah, I, I think first off, um, any BIPOC player needs to have a conversation with their coach. Um, I, I think that that's probably the, the most important just because that's who you go to when you're playing. Um, also finding another community outside of hockey. I know for myself at Yale, I realized very quickly that my teammates weren't going to be my best friends and that I needed to look elsewhere. So although I, I think a lot of people do re rely on the, the team atmosphere, I think if you are in school um, and involved in other areas, I think it's so important to, to branch out and, and recognize that there are other non-athletes out there that you connect with and other people who are willing to sp support your hockey career that aren't necessarily involved in hockey. Um, so again, like I said, Black Girl Hockey Club has been a space where I feel like I can be myself. Um, I, I can say that I can use the slang that I use. I can, um, I can do whatever really. Like I can, <laughs> I, I speak to Renee all the time and I think it's just great because um, you feel comfortable. So again, find that group that you can be with and it doesn't have to be your teammates. Um, and again, have that first conversation with your coach and let them know what your expectations are. I think that's really great advice. You know, you have to, we have to empower each other to go to the source and then support each other. And I would add, uh, you know, I don't know how you feel about this, Soroya, but I will add when we are approached uh, to receive that information and to believe that information and to find ways and a path that we can be better. Um, so I think that's important as well. But Soroya, we are going to slide on to the left and bring in Dr. Singleton, but thank you so much, Soroya. And I do wanna give a shout. You talked about Soroya being able to just kind of talk with the homies, right? And be able to, to just have that real talk. Uh, and I wanna give a shout out to Soul on Ice podcast because Soroya was on there. I saw Kiara is in the chat and of course is uh one of the scouts in the erie otters program i mentioned blake bolden she was on there kelsey colzer so uh sarah nurse i mean just an amazing group i think the episode even is is uh billed as the queens i can't disagree with that so <laughs> make sure you have a listen to that but we are going to bring in dr tanisha singleton and i think i really wanted to get that plug in for media because i know from talking with Kwame Mason, of course, the director and creator of Soul on Ice, the documentary, and now the podcast, that it's all about representation and bringing in the voices and the culture of uh, BIPOC people into hockey. And not just as the new wave, as we see Soroya being a part of that, but always knowing that part of history. Um, but, you know, Dr. Singleton, when we talk about a fan experience and that intersect between media and marketing, where do you see hockey when it comes to the ability right now to truly uh, live up to, to the slogan hockey is for everyone? You know, it's, it's such a hard and loaded question because there's so much that needs to be done, right? And we have to begin, I think, with understanding what community is. And mm -hmm. because that's, such, that's the backbone of collective thought and action and community, you know, it's largely based uh, on a person's social identity, right? So 
that that sense of who you are is based on your memberships and your affiliations to a certain group. You know, that's just the psychology of fandom and fan identity and stuff. So it's important that a community is managed, I think, at every level, because community provides the ingredients of a culture. And that's the culture of hockey that we are trying to reframe and reposition. Culture is what you stand for, right? That's what you value. So we need to empower authority. And like Soroya was saying, if you see something, say something. You know, that's what change agency I think is really all about and how that really needs to become an integral strategy into how we create media and think about media when we're looking to, you know, uh, radically reinvent what the fan experience is like, especially now because we're all experiencing new things because of this pandemic and the way that we get to interact and respond to sports is also different. So we have to be able to pivot. We have to be able to be adaptive and then responsive. You know, and so I think change agency, it should always start internally. And that's when you have to make sure that your organization, especially when it comes to media, that you have someone in a position of authority that can actively start to think about those relationships that you need to make with the community. Start to seek out some of those new skills that incorporate new media and technology. And even think about the new knowledge areas that you need to be aware of to make a positive change. So it's really daring your organization to push those boundaries in a way that is counter to the, the way this has always been, right? The, the, the traditional stuff like, well, maybe the way it's always been is what's wrong, <laughs> mm, <laughs> right? So right. that's why we need to start to er eradicate that, combat that, start to do the internal, the internal work that, that self brand audit, so to speak, and see where growth can really be achieved. Because it's funny, because Mike brought this up earlier, too, in terms of like thinking out of the box, like innovation to me, it's not something highbrow that requires, you know, a bunch of try engineering degrees and stuff like that. Innovation is recognizing a need and fulfilling it. Mm. That's it. That's real innovation. And obviously, right now, I think it's important to, to note that we're in a place of humanity where it's like, we're unfortunately in a back to basics mindset, right? Like we have to tell people it's not cool to be racist again. Like what, the, really? Like we're, I didn't know we needed LL Cool J commercials to remind us to wash our hands. Like we are literally in this back to basics mindset. And so right now, even being innovative is a way to dare people to make a positive difference and create resources to serve those that have been disserved. Mm. And I think that's real innovation. And I think that's what media has the opportunity to, to present as a solution for those things. I really appreciate you offering that because again, and you know, Mr. Watson was given some of these questions about changing things up in this virtual socially distant um, kind of, society that we have right now. And I think that when we talk about hockey is for everyone, or even when we talk about diversity and inclusion, I think a lot of people default for that to look a certain way and to target certain communities. But I want to go back to a question that we have here in the chat, actually, that, that Jen uh, posed, and I'm going to remix it just a little bit, but I think Dr. Singleton, you might be able to hit on this. You know, how realistic is it to um, utilize some of this new media now to be able to incorporate a, a, a community, a disabled community? So not just hard of hearing with captions, but are there other ways also to embrace all types of hockey communities uh, in this day and age and using media? Absolutely. I mean, it starts with, we just have to flex our imagination. If we start there, know that everything is possible, then you can start to shift culture and create real change and make something that used to be impossible. We just have to first, you know, change that narrative, flex our own imagination, because, you know, right now it's, it, it is important because like you said, bringing up that the hashtag, like hockey is for everyone and stuff. I think all of us could screen grab our mentions and show it to prove that a lot of people don't believe that. 
<laughs> right? Some of the comments that we get, Renee's face right now, no one can see it, but I'm telling you, we all have seen the our block button is always on fire because a lot of us have just gotten the most negative, I almost swore, <laughs> the negative stuff that that totally counters the whole hashtag. So it behooves everyone, black, white, everyone to rewrite hockey's narrative to prove that, it, show me your receipts, right? If you, what you value, how are you supporting that? What actions are you doing to prove that? You know, not just doing something for the clout as the kids say, but actually making it illustrative of what hockey is, which is, the best damn live sporting event going, a worldwide game that's full of skill and athleticism that everyone in the family can enjoy. Right now, that's not what's being told. Right now, it's toxic, it's meathead, it's racist and misogynistic. I used to bartend in LA for years and if I put on a game, they're like, what's a black girl watching hockey for? Always got that. So many of us I know can tell you stories about what we've been called and the feelings that we've felt as people of color and women uh, of color live at hockey games from other fans in attendance. It's not, it's not illustrative of the ha hashtag hockey is for everyone. So we have to do that work. And I think if we can imagine it and making it more inclusive for every community, then we can do it. But it starts with uh, consciously having that approach in mind when you're developing growth strategies. And so much of that is from marketing as well. Like we have to lead from the front, mm. you know, like we have to start to make sure that we are completely being inclusive. And that I think, you know, representation matters. Like we've been saying that Mr. Roy reiterated that as well. You know, I, I don't think we can underestimate the power of firsts. Mm first to do something like that, that's huge, you know? And I've said it before, but it's like, you know, with my PhD, that's essentially like 22, 23 years of school that I've went through. I've had three black teachers in that entire time. Four, if you include my kindergarten teacher, Miss Mitchell, who taught me how to make a turkey out of my hand. But other than that, right. <laughs> but other than that, three. Representation matters. And it wasn't until COVID and the absence of sport to remind everyone how essential it is, right? And especially as, you know, black female and a massive sports fan, I recognize that the reason why I love sports so much is because it's the only place that I can regularly go to find people who look like me succeed. Mm. Outside mm. of sports and entertainment, where oh. else can you regularly go to see someone of color being praised for something. We used to not be able to say, you know, we are just now starting to change that, right? We've, you know, our new VP elect, we are just now starting to change that slowly but surely. But that's why sports and, and specifically, you know, hockey culture, it can do some radical change by starting to remarket and reframe its own narrative, but it's gotta be from within. It's got to be. And that's about being adaptive and responsive. You see, and it's okay to not know, right? That's how, that's why the Erie Otters came to us. They had questions and that's okay because it starts with humility. We have to remove the ego, people in positions of authority. We have to remove that ego to sincerely reach out to those that you want to start to engage with and you want to start to involve and just ask. Mm. Mike talked about that. Ask for help. Right. Ask, ask what I don't know. How do I help? What do I need to do? And then that's, you know, obviously what Black Girl Hockey Club is here for and why there's many other organizations, you know, like Soroya's uh, mentorship program. You don't know, we are here to help you, but you got to ask. And that takes with, you know, breaking down that ego. Don't be, you know, you, we have to be humble enough to know that we don't know everything and that there is much more to be done. And then that's when we can respond accordingly. And I think as we start to wrap and then we'll we'll bring all of the panelists on just in a few minutes here, but there are a few different questions and comments here, Dr. Singleton, that I think you might be able to address. And I'm gonna try and wrap it all in a nice little bow for you. But, you know, we have Reiki talking about 
um, you know, feeling the you know, very, you know, on the spot as, as someone who maybe represents and identifies a community that's not regularly seen at, at hockey arenas. So what does work with hockey clubs uh, and, and professional teams look like? And another question that we see here uh, is, you know, maybe what, are, what is one thing, what is a really good first step for those types of organizations that's fan base is saying, you know, I'm maybe not comfortable or I don't feel represented here. I mean, is there a really good first step? You know, from, from the fan perspective or for like a, I think because part of what we want to talk about here Uh is that fan engagement. So if you are a club, obviously the Erie Otters put this together and, Uh and I think that this is, you know, their first step. Uh, But what are some good first steps uh, for an organization that sees and identifies that there's a fan base um, and a community that wants to be engaged, uh, but maybe just doesn't know uh, where that on-ramp is. Yeah. Creating opportunities for online and offline, you know, when we're able to go outside again, um, is, is really, really important because there's research that shows that, you know, fan identification at all different levels. So including those that are shy and not, you know, as loud and, and as boisterous as I am on Twitter when I'm watching a live sporting event, um, but all the way down from top to bottom, we've seen that those that are emotionally affiliated they have a much greater sport experience. They have a much greater boost in their own esteem. And so when they feel represented, when they feel that, that they are not an only, then that's when you can get that extra boost of confidence and feeling like you're associated with someone and you're not an only anymore. And we're not othering because mm-hmm. othering is also a very negative thing that can make people even more divisive, that us versus them. We need to break that down. And so, I mean, I really like to use the the strategy I came up with called the three E's. So that's emotion, engagement, and experience. And I think if brands and organizations start to create emotionally binding content, start Mm -hmm. to tell the stories of the athletes, finding other touch points of how you can relate to someone, that's super helpful. And that's something that even a shy fan or someone who hasn't been marketed towards in your traditional markets can actually start to be like, oh my God, like I too, blah, blah, blah. And engagement, obviously, you know, it's, it's all about being able to create those prompts of engagement. And because when you're socially active, fans become your digital infantry like of support, right? Like how often do we see somebody attack someone? We'd be like, not today. And we just go right in it and be like, no. And so we are that digital army of support. And then the experience, that's really what it's all about because products and services, they come and go, right? But experiences is what lasts forever. We all remember our first live sporting event. We all remember the first jersey we got and the first player that we met. So experiences are undefeated. And if we can start to from internally from the organization, independently as an athlete, and now as a fan, start to make sure that everything we're doing is informing the design of an experience that is truly positive and inclusive for everyone, then you've got something that can really help hockey grow. I love it. And Dr. Singleton, as we bring in the rest of the panelists and get ready to uh, bring it over to Renee, who I hope mentions that infographic that I love so much. Uh, I just would love it if you can give us those three E's again. I know we have a lot of representation from different organizations and clubs, and I, I just like to take it from the top, from the yes. three E's. Emotion, engagement, and experience. Emotion, engagement, and experience. And we hope that we have been able to tap into all three of those today. Uh, It has been my delight to facilitate conversations with each one of you. And as I mentioned, we are going to bring it over to the fearless leader of the Black Girl Hockey Club, Renee Hess. Wow, what an amazing conversation. You know, when I asked Wes Wolf, who is the assistant coach for the Erie Otters, why the Otters wanted to host this event with Black Girl Hockey Club, this is what he told me. He said, it is the inherited responsibility of all team members of the Erie Otters to be a great person and leader, whether they are a player, coach, manager, scout, or front office executive. 
We feel it is important to let the world know we are ready to get uncomfortable and learn how to be better allies and better people. I think this event has done that for all the attendees. We've touched on some incredibly important topics while receiving advice and action points to help us better engage authentically with the BIPOC community. My hope is that BIPOC folks feel seen and heard and that our allies are able to step away with tangible ways to get uncomfortable in your own communities and to, that you can help facilitate a shift in hockey culture. Thank you so much to Erica, Soroya, Tanisha, and Mike, and all of our viewers for participating, for listening, for asking questions, and for being willing to get uncomfortable with Black Girl Hockey Club and the Erie Otters. I'm gonna take the last few minutes and maybe we can go through some of the questions in the Q&A that we have not touched on yet. Uh, one that I thought was really interesting and important is from Estella. It says, while the Black Lives Matter movement push has been important and we have been blessed to bring our group to attention, how do you recommend we filter through media needs and requests? Do we educate all requests? My fear is that there's no long-term commitment for the community and just an opportunity to be an ally. What do you guys think about that? Erica's nodding. Let's unmute, let's unmute and, and have a conversation. Wow, yeah, I really, I really love that. I think that, um, you know, performative gestures are really um, uh, challenging for me uh, as a fan, as a journalist, um, you know, as someone who was an athlete way back in the day. Um, and as, again, as a black Latina, because unfortunately I feel that in my life I've been conditioned for people to let me down in this space. Um, what I would say is, as far as what you choose to engage in or not, I mean, truly make it a choice that is your own, not necessarily something that you have to explain to anyone else um, and protect your peace. Um, but what I try to do, and this is, I can only give my advice is I actually try to uh, hashtag get uncomfortable. And sometimes it's the opportunities that I um, have hesitation about the most that I then challenge myself to, to think about how I can perhaps be present um, and be a part of the solution. Um, and so that's just how I, I personally approach it because much like Soroya said, with her uh, thinking about her brother, you know, I think of other people who maybe want to get into media and I, I feel that if I'm not present, if I don't occupy that space, even if temporarily, that, you know, that, that space might not exist anymore. I totally agree. I mean, it's important for us as BIPOC folks to get uncomfortable ourselves and have those conversations with our allies and, and with our friends and, and even with our family. And I'm going to go on to this next question because I think it ties in to this idea of us getting uncomfortable. This is from Ashley. She asks, how can we also begin to change thinking around our own BIPOC people who still believe that hockey is not a sport that Black people play? Uh, I know that if you are a Black hockey fan like me, you have probably had your fellow uh, black family friends say uh, black people don't don't play hockey. Black people don't watch hockey. What do we what do we do to change that thinking within our own community? Watch it in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you do it. You do it. I mean, and you do it unapologetically and you do it with passion because it's you're not doing it for you know, for no, anything less than just your own enjoyment and passion. We're allowed to have fun too. And we're allowed to do that in any space that, you know, is not harmful to anybody else. If the game is on, I'm going to, I'm going to watch it. You know, it's what you want to do. And so there is, you know, just even culturally within some of our own different communities and, and even regionally, um, things are very different in terms of values and fandoms and stuff like that. But it's and some of it is generational too and so there's nothing it's hard you can't change the mind of someone you know it's you can't teach someone who doesn't want to be taught and so part of it is also just like living your life if you want to watch something do it i don't care like i'm not i've never been one to you know i grew up watching everything you know and i've got a 
closet full of wrestling action figures to my left that you guys can't see. And people made fun of me for like watching that and being a fan of that when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, okay. Let me make sure I wear my Macho Man shirt every time I see you. Because I, that's just my personality, you know? So there isn't, I don't think, a, 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 a really doctoral answer to that uh, that I could give other than just like own it own what you love and have that confidence, you know, because there, if no one in your family is, is, a, is a fan of hockey, we can be your hockey family. That's why we're here. And, I love and that. You, you know, and this is Mike, I, I think what's so interesting about that question and the preceding question is, it's really about, you know, the, the experience, right? And, and Tanisha says it right, you know, you, you have to experience it. And, and I think the underlying of that is for so long, black people have probably felt disenfranchised by hockey, right? They, that connection wasn't there to get them involved, right? So that's one thing with Ice Hockey Club, our executive director who was a finalist for the Willie O'Ree Award, how he built Ice Hockey Club was through roller hockey, street hockey. It wasn't at an ice rink, right? And so it's that's why I said, you know, when you're talking about creating fans, you know, we've created so many BIPOC fans, you know, here in central Ohio, because they can now engage in the games at the 28 rec centers, right? So we have hockey sticks, we have ball hockey, right? It, it's not always about, hey, you have to be on ice and have the money to, to afford it. No, you have to meet the fans where they are. Right. And then you have to give them tickets to go to the game and don't push season tickets on them. Right. Let them engage in the game in a way that they're most comfortable. Right. Reach out. Somebody was saying, I think on one of the calls, you know, on one of the, Renee on a previous call, we were talking about it. Hey, put some advertisement on like some of the some of the BIPOC radio stations that are out there, the podcasts that are going on, the sites that that they visit. So you kind of have to elevate hockey into those communities, too, as well. Right. And I, and I tell people the time is now. There are a ton of people on this call who have a ton of influence, a ton of power. And the time is now for us to step more strongly into that because the momentum's with us. Yeah, and lastly, I'll add from a player's per, uh, perspective, I think just just do it, like play the game, do it, and do it well. Um, I think one of the biggest things my dad told me was just to prove people wrong. Uh, I think a lot of the times when I tell people I play hockey, it's, oh, you play field hockey? Or it's like, are you even good? And it's like, yeah, come check out one of the games. I am good. So I've had a lot of my BIPOC friends um just simply wonder what it's like, what the speed is like, and if I can even play. And it's like, yeah, I, I've been a starter, like come watch. So um, in those cases, I know a lot of my my Yale friends have come to watch the game and they're like, wow, like it's, it's weird that you're black and play hockey, but at the same time, it's pretty cool because we see you out there killing it um, in comparison to your white counterparts. So um, do it and do it well. <laughs> yeah, like how cool is it when we see, you know, uh, other black women playing tennis, you know, when I see, you know, every Coco Golf coming out, I'm like, yes! like, it's just, I love it. And it's because, you know, and she's even cited like Venus, Serena, that they, you know, helped instill that motivation. It's like to be their best, you know, despite a hundred social constructs that write us off. And, you know, I think, uh, the idea of going to where the fans are. Erica mentioned that amazing uh, infographic uh, that is on the Black Girl Hockey Club website called Authentic Engagement with the Black Community. And that's one of the points that you have to go to the communities that you want to engage with and, and engage within that community with people that are from that community. If you want uh, to talk to that community, whether it is the Black community, the Native community, the LGBTQ community, you have to hire people from that community. You have to be authentic and, and purposeful in the way that you engage with them, as you were talking about uh, in your conversation um, with Erica, Dr. Singleton. Um, I do have one more question that I want to address. This is from um, our viewers on YouTube. This is in their live chat box. Uh, they asked, would you have some suggestions on as to how a parent can help raise awareness or approach the coaching staff about helping to promote 
team inclusiveness. And this is something I've run into numerous times with black parents, <clears throat> black moms uh, who have experienced you know, racism with their kids. So what do you suggest um, on how to approach a coaching staff that maybe doesn't know, um, isn't in the right place to get uncomfortable? You know, the first step is is to have the conversation, right? And I and I tell people, you know, being kind of heading up, you know, an ice hockey club as the president, you could imagine. I walk into a lot of rooms and I'm the last person that people expect to walk in the room, particularly who understands how to build a hockey organization, who understands how to build elite players, who understands how to move kids along to the next level, who understands to build programs, right? And so for me, you know, you got to start with a, hey, coach, you know, just take them off, you know, not a big, not a big in front of everybody. Hey, off to the side. Hey, I want to talk to you about a couple of things, right? You know, have the research available. Hey, you know, I want to, I want to talk to you about this so we can talk, talk through this and how we progress the team. Because look, this conversation isn't going away. USA Hockey is putting together training you know, that all coaches are going to have to take if they're not taking it right now, right? So this should not be something new to that coach you're going to approach. And I will say this, if you approach that coach and you don't get someone who's like, hey, tell me more, they're inquisitive, they want to learn, they want to educate themselves, then I would say, is that a coach that you want your child playing for, right? And I will unabashedly say that, right? Because an ice hockey club, our coaches, whether they are BIPOC or not, they have to believe in our core principles of inclusivity and diversity. So any coach who believes in that will understand when you come to talk to them. As a matter of fact, they probably should be expecting it. So if you're one of those coaches and you've got a BIPOC player on your team and you think the parent isn't having these questions, they do. You might want to pull the parent aside and say, hey, tell me about the experience that your kid is having. Is there anything that I can do? And be willing to listen. That, that's all it takes, you know, meet them where they are, right? Instead of making them come to where you are. I think that's the, <laughs> your, your theme, Mike, is meet them where they are. You, you continue to say that. And I believe that, especially in this context, it's very important. I love the idea of coaches and staff being proactive, reaching out to the parents, the families and the players um, the, the BIPOC players and asking them what their experiences are and how they can help. Because oftentimes, as we heard from Soroya, they might not even feel comfortable making that first move as a coach, as a leader in that organization to make that move and to take that power and put it into the hands of the BIPOC player and their families, their parents. That's that's a huge, and that is a wonderful first step. Um, I think that's gonna be all for our questions. We're gonna wrap it up um, in, in just a second. I just wanna say thank you again to all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Singleton, Soroya, Mike, and of course, Erica for moderating. This has been an amazing conversation. Uh, this webinar will be available on the Black Girl Hockey Club YouTube channel. Uh, today's resource guide is already up on our website. So please, if you haven't checked it out yet, take a look at it. And while you're there, you can look at and hopefully sign the Black Girl Hockey Club's Get Uncomfortable Pledge. Keep an eye on our social media for more events like this one. Uh, and make sure that you are following us on Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, also, don't forget if you are in need the Black Girl Hockey Club scholarship application is now open. It will be open until December 31st. It's on our website as are a whole bunch of other resources, uh, information available there for you to uh, check out. We also have a newsletter and all sorts of ways that you can keep in contact with the Black Girl Hockey Club if you so desire. We appreciate you coming. We appreciate you listening and learning, and now's the time for action. So I hope that you can leave this uh, conversation with some action items, some things that you can do in your team, in your club, in your city, in your organization 
uh, to facilitate change and to be anti-racist. So on behalf of Black Girl Hockey Club and all of our panelists, thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Have a great rest of your